Dominde again. So we continue with our series of the tick system, and we said it's craniosacral in origin. So we had already discussed the third cranial nerve and the seventh cranial nerve, the involvement in the parasitic system. So now originated from the inferior salivary nucleus. Remember the ones from facial were from superior salivary intracranial nucleus. These ones are from inferior salivary nucleus. Then the preganglion nerve. nerve. Then they will traverse through the tympanic plexus and enter the lesser petrosol nerve. From the lesser petrosol nerve, these preganglionic fibers will relay in the otic ganglion. Then through their synapsing with the post ganglion, the post ganglionic fibers now will ganglion, um, hitchhike onto the origin from mandivision of trigeminal to get to the parotid gland. So the main function of so as a laboratory nucleus, you have preganglionic fibers through the glossopharyngeal, the tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve, then which will enter the petrosol into otic ganglion and relay on ganglionic that will hit the branch of mandibular division of trigeminal to get to the parotid gland and cause it to secrete saliva and cause vasodilatation within the gland. So um, then we go to the 10th cranial nerve, which is the vagus nerve. Again, um, the nuclear of origin, the parasympathetic nuclear of origin is the dorsal vagal nucleus. That's where the efferents will arise from. And this will travel through the vagus nerve to its um, other, to um, pulmonary, cardiac, esophageal, gastric, intestinal, and other branches. And these fibers usually are relayed on very um, small ganglia, which usually lie on the walls of the viscera. So the um, preganglionic ganglia of vagus nerve are very long to relay at that region. So what is the distribution of this vagus nerve in the parasympathetic? So, for example, in the heart, the preganglionic fibers will synapse with postganglionic within the cardiac plexus. These are located on the walls of the atria of the heart. Then, from there, the postganglionic will then go and supply the sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodes and muscle fibers of the heart as well as the muscles of the coronary arteries. Then uh, the vagus also innervates, provides parasympathetic innervation to the lungs. So you have the preganglionic fibers, they get to the tracheobronchial ganglia within the pulmonary plexus and synapse with postganglionic fibers, which go and supply the smooth muscles and mucosal glands of the trachea and the bronchial tree, as well as the blood vessels of the lungs. So the parasympathetic stimulation in the lungs will cause bronchoconstriction, so you constrict the bronchi, and stimulate the secretions from the mucosal glands. Then vagus also supplies parasympathetic innervation to the stomach and the intestines, where the preganglionic fibers, remember from the dorsal vagal nucleus, will get to the esophageal plexus. Then through um, the esophageal hiatus, they will enter the abdomen in the anterior and posterior, using the anterior and posterior vagal trunks that are located anterior and posterior to the esophagus. And these fibers will thereafter distribute to the stomach and the small and large intestines. The fibers usually terminate on postganglionic neurons, and these postganglionic neurons are within the myenteric plexus, or also called the Arbax uh, plexus, and the submucosal plexuses that are also called the Meissner's plexus. So from the, uh, these plexuses, postganglionic neurons will originate and through short fibers will terminate on smooth muscle cells and the gland cells of the um, um, small and large intestines. So what's the effect of this? of uh, innervating the stomach and the intestines. There is increased peristaltic rate. Parasympathetic stimulation causes increase in peristalsis and increase in the tone of the smooth muscles. There is also relaxation of sphincters as well as stimulation of um, secretions from intestinal glands. So that's the cranial um, aspect of the parasympathetic pathway. But remember, we also said parasympathetic originates from some portions, some sacral portions. So we have my of S2, S3, and S4 sp uh, spinal nerves usually give direct uh, visceral branches to the pelvic viscera. And these usually form pelvic splanchnic nerves that unite with the branches of sympathetic pelvic plexuses. So the ganglia in the walls of, uh, are located in the walls of individual viscera. And from this ganglia, the um, postganglionic fibers will get to the motor fibers, will uh, give motor fibers to the rectum and the bladder wall, 
the postganglionic fibers also supply the inhibitory fibers to the bladder sphincter. So then we also have the vasodilator fibers to erectile tissue of the penis and the, and the clitoris, as well as postganglionic fibers to the colon, the uterine tube, and the uterus. So from this information, you can see that parasympathetic stimulation will cause um, contraction of bladder muscles and the rectal muscles. Um, however, the parasympathetic stimulation inhibits um, the bladder sphincters and causes vasodilation within the erectile tissue of the penis and the clitoris. So this image just shows you, you can see from the, the third, uh, parasympathetic is craniosacral, so you have the third, seventh, ninth, and tenth cranial nerves, and also from S2, S3, S4 um, spinal nerve components. So from the third cranial nerve, we see it, you carry from Edinger westphal nucleus, uh, through oculomotor motor nerve, you get to ciliary ganglion and synapse with postganglionic that will cause um, constriction of the sphincter pupillae and the ciliary muscles to aid in accommodation. Then the seventh cranial nerve from superior salivary and lacrimal nucleus to the pterygopalatine ganglion and submandibular ganglion, you innervate the lacrimal glands, the nasal mucosa and sublingual and submandibular glands. Then the ninth cranial nerve through the glossopharyngeal, the tympanic branch, you get to the otic ganglion through the lesser petrosal nerve. Thereafter, postganglionic fibers hitchhike on auriculotemporal to get to the parotid gland and cause it to secrete saliva. Lastly, the tenth cranial nerve, we have seen from the dorsal um, nucleus of vagus nerve, then to the different plexuses located within the wall. So the cardiac plexus is in the heart, the tracheobronchial plexuses and the uh, pulmonary plexuses to the lungs, and then through the esophageal plexuses, following the anterior and posterior vagal trunks, you get to the stomach and the small intestines. Then the sacral component, S2 to S4, they get directly to the uh, viscera within the pelvic region, so the uterus, the um, urinary bladder, the rectum, and so on and so forth. So then we go to the sympathetic system. Remember, parasympathetic is craniosacral, sympathetic is thoracolumbar. So from T1 to T12, then also involving the upper lumbar L1 and L2. The cell bodies of sympathetic preganglionic neurons are usually within the lateral horn of the gray matter of the spinal cord within T1 to L2 region. So the cell bodies of the preganglionic fibers are in the lateral horn. Then they emerge from the spinal cord, they follow the ventral roots. From there, they enter the spinal nerve trunk, where the nerve trunk therefore divides to form the um, white remi communicantes, and from there, the sympathetic ganglia will end in the sympathetic trunk. So you can see from the lateral, we have the lateral horn only between T1 and L2. The sympathetic fibers will follow the ventral horn, the ventral root nerve. The white remi communicantes are the ones that will form your um, sympathetic outflow that will get to the sympathetic trunk. So from T1 to L2, the lateral horn, the cell bodies are in the lateral horn, then they follow the ventral roots, then they eventually, through the white um, remi communicators, get to the sympathetic trunk, and it's from the sympathetic trunk that postganglionic fibers will get to the target organs. So the sympathetic trunk um, contains ganglionated nerve trunks that lie on either side of the vertebral column. You can see you have sympathetic trunks on both the right and the left side. So they lie on both sides of the vertebral column. And each trunk consists of a series of ganglia, and these ganglia are interconnected by nerve fibers and therefore form a chain. So you can see this chain made up of several ganglia. Having reached the sympathetic trunk, what happens? The preganglionic fibers, number one, they may end in the corresponding ganglion. So if the um, preganglionic fiber is from T1, it may end on the ganglion located at T1. Okay, so it synapses with a postganglionic cell at that area, corresponding ganglion at T1. However, it may also pass through the corresponding ganglion without synapsing. It may ascend to a ganglion above it or descend to a ganglion below it before it synapses. So it may synapse at a ganglion at the same level or it may pass at the corresponding ganglion same level. After that, ascend to a ganglion above or descend to a ganglion below before synapsing. Then lastly, this preganglionic fiber may also pass through the corresponding ganglion 
ascend or descend uninterrupted, and then emerge in medially directed fibers of sympathetic trunk. And after that, they enter the autonomic nervous plexus where they terminate in the ganglion cells. So this is what we mean. It can come to the same level and synapse. However, it may come and at the corresponding level but still ascend to synapse at a ganglia above it or it may descend to synapse at a ganglia below it. Again, this one has come to the corresponding level, ganglia at the corresponding level, but it gets to the target organ to synapse. So this just shows what happens. Other preganglionic um, neurons, they do not synapse within the sympathetic trunk. What happens? They will go to the medulla of the suprarenal gland. Suprarenal gland is the adrenal gland. It's called suprarenal because it sits at the superior pole of the kidney. So the preganglionic neurons will leave the lateral horn of um, the spinal cord where the sympathetic originates. And then instead of synapsing in the sympathetic trunk, they get to the medulla of the suprarenal gland and terminate on chromaffin um, cells of the adrenal medulla. So these chromaffin cells of adrenal medulla usually produce norepinephrine and epinephrine, which regulate the sympathetic nervous system. So what are the uh, parts of the sympathetic trunk? We have the cervical um, thoracic lumbar and the pelvic um, uh, parts of the sympathetic trunk. And the cervical sympathetic trunk lies on the prevertebral muscles and they're usually located behind the carotid sheath in the carotid triangle of the neck. They have, uh, usually the cervical trunk has three ganglia that are interconnected, a superior, middle, and inferior cervical ganglia. So the inferior cervical ganglion usually fuses with the first or second thoracic ganglia to form a cervical thoracic ganglion, which is also called the stellate ganglion. The stellate ganglion can be located anterior to the transverse process of C7 or the neck of the first rib or posterior to the vertebral vessels and the dome of the pleura. Then we go to the middle cervical ganglion. This one is usually small and it's variable and the interganglionic ramus between the middle and inferior cervical ganglia usually form a loop which we call the ansa subclavia. The interganglionic ramus between the middle and inferior cervical ganglia form the ansa subclavia around the subclavian artery. Then lastly, the superior cervical ganglion, it's usually 2.5 centimeters long and it usually extends within two centimeters of the skull base. Then we go to the thoracic um, sympathetic trunk. Remember, this is your sympathetic trunk lying parallel to the, the vertebral column. So the thoracic sympathetic trunk lies on the neck of the ribs in the upper thorax and at the side of the vertebra in the lower part. They lie behind the pleura and in front of the intercostal vessels. Usually, the thoracic trunk leaves the thorax by passing behind the medial arcuate ligament. Remember, this ligament of the thoracic diaphragm. So behind the medial arcuate ligament to become continuous with the lumbar trunk. Then the lumbar trunk lies anterior, on the anterior lateral surface of the lumbar vertebra. So it's nearer to the midline than the thoracic part, and it's located medial to psoas major muscle. The right lumbar trunk lies behind the inferior vena cava, and both of them pass behind the adrenal, renal, gonadal, and common iliac vessels. And each of the lumbar sympathetic trunk will cross the sacral promontory to become continuous with the, with the pelvic trunk. Now, the pelvic trunk, on the other hand, runs downwards in the pelvic surface of the sacrum. And medial to the first three anterior sacral foramina, in front to the ventral ramus of the fourth sacral spinal nerve, the two pelvic trunks unite. In front of the ventral ramus of the fourth sacral spinal nerve, the two um, pelvic sympathetic trunks unite in front of the coccyx and end in a small unpaired ganglion, which we call the ganglion impa. So the sympathetic postganglionic fibers can be distributed following the spinal nerves through the gray rami communicantes. They can follow the cranial nerves or plexuses around arteries, or the postganglionic fibers may just directly form visceral branches to the organs. So the next slide will discuss the pre-vertebral autonomic plexus. Thank you.